All right, guys. Uh, what's going on with Java? All right. Uh, and I may go a little bit fast because uh, I've tried this out and it may last about 40 minutes. Um, also, so this is a talk about languages. It may get a little bit opinionated. The stuff is just my opinions. Ruby forever. Ruby forever. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, what am I going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about some predictions I've seen. Uh, do a quick uh, peruse through the history of programming languages so we know what makes uh, higher programming languages. And then um, I'm going to go walk through three uh, JVM alternatives and then kind of tell you guys why or why you should not use them. Uh, so first of all, uh, do, we have any, do we have any .NET developers? Because uh, I put in a star of like, uh, Java's going away, and so is C Sharp, because uh, C Sharp, we all know C Sharp's exactly the same as Java, right? Uh, just kidding. It's totally not true. I mean, the predictions that uh, you may have heard, I have heard these all the time, like, oh, Java's 22 years old. Uh, it's senior citizen age for, like, languages. <laughs> Millennial, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, it's just, it's the next uh, COBOL or Fortran, and, like, Functional programming, it's the new thing. Uh, we should be 100% functional, immutable, everything. And, th and this is all stuff I have personally heard from developers like telling me about how awesome all these languages are. Oh, pardon me? <laughs> but what, about, what about the Scala thing? It's, it's scalable, isn't that awesome? Uh, and actually, true fact, uh, Scala, the name Scala does not come from scalability, but anyways. Uh, what about this Node.js thing? It has, uh, has non-blocking I.O. Like, isn't, we should be using this stuff. Uh, and who's this guy? Like, who's this guy telling you guys that like, Java's going away? Uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, like, I've taken most of the Java certs. Uh, I used to teach Java. I'm from Calgary, so actually James Gosling's from Calgary. Uh, <laughs> I know, like, he's a Canadian. I know it's pretty I used to work for ThoughtWorks for five years. Awesome company. Uh, I've been called Mr. Yagni. I actually bought the domain, mryagni.com, if you go there right now. Uh, it's actually my domain. I haven't set it up yet, uh, but I've been called Mr. Yagni because I always kind of take a more conservative approach to programming. Because everyone, I find developers are always like, yeah, what's the new shiny thing? And like microservices and Node.js. I've always been a little bit more uh, uh, conservative, and it served me well. And my interests, uh, I love kind of exploring programming languages, leanness, and like making uh, developers more efficient, and also I have a small bias for Groovy, and that will show. Uh, if are you running for office, I'll definitely vote for Mr. Yagni. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I did actually buy that domain three days ago, uh, and I think I put an image on top. I haven't figured it out. That will probably be my official website going forward. Uh, before I get into like what's going on next for uh, programming languages, uh, I, I want to like quickly have take a simplified, simplified. Uh, history of like an evolution of programming languages. I've totally jumped a couple of spots and I may have like fudged things for like dramatic uh, story purposes, but for the most part, it's kind of true. So we're gonna quickly go back in time. Uh, and also, uh, okay, so like long time ago, computers were really slow. I know like 1985, like the first, first computer that I programmed on was like a 286 with like QBasic. I think in 1985, I mean, this is what you would have like 15 megahertz. 650 kilobytes of RAM, uh, a lot of programming. Actually, sorry, and even though I mentioned machine code and assembly language, like there was better languages at the time. I just kind of grouped things together uh, for story purposes. But you also had like low low level programming, so pretty bare metal machine code assembly language. Uh, like back in the day, I'd like I've never seen a punch card. I don't know has anyone here You've seen a punch card? <laughs> Old crowd. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is this is a punch card. I found this online. Uh, apparently, this is some kind of for loop. Uh, but the, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, so this is some kind of for loop. Uh, on the the columns are you have your bytes, but for some reason it's actually ten bits instead of eight. So this is some kind of ten bit stuff, and it would just translate straight to machine code. Uh, I mean, this is what you would do: is just punch this stuff and like put it in and run it. Obviously. Not exactly what I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not that. You punch it in a cross your fingers and you'd run it, and it didn't run. Or the worst case is you like you'd have all these cards and then you trip and then like everything would be out of order. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so then, then we had assembly where it just it was more or less a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, but you kind of kind of made things a little bit more human readable. So on the left, I have some machine code in a decimal format, uh, and then on the right, I'm just converting it to like human readable. So in this case, it's like a hey, 430000 actually means increment uh, register EBX. Uh, so, so assembly, what were the advantages? I mean, it was, it was awesome for performance because uh, you're pretty much bare metal. Uh, certainly easier than uh, punch cards to read. And it did have some minor abstractions. Like I say, it was a one-to-one -one mapping, but there was like some, some things that kind of added to make things more readable. So this would be like the uh, symbolic ad addresses and the mnemonics for commands. So this is kind of what I mean. Uh, I, I don't think, I, I don't actually know exactly what the thing on the left is. Uh, so, so the, the thing on the right is actually uh, the assembly, some assembly loop. Uh, is, do you guys code assembly here? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I used to, but haven't had to. Yeah. Uh, no reason to anymore. Yeah. I mean, so what? Like, what are the what are the disadvantages? Right? Like, it's uh, it's actually it's it's very verbose. I mean, like, it's going to be a lot of commands. Uh, it's hard to read and understand. There's a lot of like low level details that like you don't care like. It's not human speak. Like I don't know what. I don't think even nowadays. I don't think your average uh, college grad is going to know what a register is or a call stack is. I think like the default university programming language language nowadays is Java. So like I had all the stuff that was like computer speak and not human speak. And at the same time, it lacked all this like human speak where there's no arrays, there's no functions, no loops, uh, no like memory management. You just like you just write to to random addresses. Uh, mythical man month. So has everyone read this book? Yeah. Uh, so I bring this book up because I know everyone like they use Mythical Man Month for the whole, uh, you know, you can't like make a project go faster because um, it's gonna like it, you can't throw more developers at a project to make it go faster. But there's another really really good line that is really kind of the focus of this talk that he brings up. Uh, so he, they did a whole bunch of studies, uh, and he, he gives examples. But basically, his conclusion was like, hey, no matter what programming language you're using, you're going to average out to the same amount of lines of code per day. Uh, and he said 10. I, I don't know how true it is. But like, I think if you factor in everything, like testing, debugging, I know, deploying, all the stuff, it kind of averages out. So like, and the point is, like, the higher you go, um, like the higher you go at the programming language, the more like closer you get to like English speak or human speak, and the less lines of code, like the more you could express in one line, the faster in theory you could get. He didn't know PHP, that's why he wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so what happened next? I mean, uh, computers got faster, more resources. And uh, so 10 years later, I mean, in, you have Pentium Intels, like from a 286 to a Pentium Intel, like it's a huge, <laughs> huge difference. And then uh, the next kind of, Loose uh, programming style was structured programming. Um, yeah, and I, like I know it came way before 1995, but it like it lines. Uh, and what what did they do? I mean, like they removed registers. Pardon me. Pardon me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Why I put it in there. <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna focus on C, uh, but I put in some examples. Uh, so we. You know, we remove these lower level details, registers, call stacks. We added higher level human constructs, memory management, flow statements. Like assembly didn't have while loops or if statements or like not true if statements and all the stuff. So we added that. I mean, so that example that I gave of assembly, uh, I mean, the C equivalent is that. It's like much easier to read for a human. I mean, the, the machine prefers the thing on the right, but like for a human, much easier, and it's also less lines of code. So going by like the theory of like less lines of code makes you um, like more concise lines of code makes you more productive. Like you just doubled your productivity. And then like what are the advantages? Like easier to read for humans, less error prone, like no go tos, uh, uh, memory management, less lines of code, and like. Uh, developer productivity increased, and developers uh, rejoiced. Uh, but I did want to point out that like assembly still existed, 
it never got like totally phased out. And I'll like, so there's an alternative I know with like video game programming. I don't know how much it happens nowadays with like really good compilers, but I know like when I was doing video game programming in C, you would still occasionally do like inline assembly and like to like really, really performance tune. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and actually, uh, the other thing, does, has anyone ever played this game? Well, awesome game. What's even more awesome about it is one guy, this is a 19, game in 1999 came out for Pentiums. One guy, Chris Sawyer, wrote the entire thing in assembly. Uh, like pretty, pretty mind blowing, especially if you've coded an assembly, because I, I don't know how he did it. I mean, so it's still kind of being used. Uh, then more time went on, computers got faster, more resources. Uh, 2006, I kind of fudged it by a year because like uh, Core 2 Intel is, is, is what, 2006 is when Core 2 came out, like single door, dual core really became popular. Uh, I think just like the average I pulled off the internet was 1.5 gigahertz. Again, a huge boost. Uh, object oriented programming started getting like more mainstream, so Java C. Uh, like the core languages, Java and C, like the most popular ones, uh, it was an easy transition from older languages. Um, removed a lot of the lower level details, like pointers, and then I added higher, like higher level human constructs, like temp, type safety, generics, collections, etc. Uh, and then, like I mean, what are the advantages? Even more human readable, even less error prone, even less lines of code, and again, uh, developer productivity increased, and uh, developers rejoiced. Uh, was object-oriented programming the next big thing? Anyone? Sure. Yes. Uh, I don't think it was. I, I was supposed, it was kind of like people thought it was going to be the next big thing, but I mean, um, I think even like Linus Torvalds like did a huge big rant on like C++ over C and like, I know uh, there's like a whole bunch of issues like di uh, diamond inheritance and like did it really make productivity that much better? I don't know. Dijkstra said about it. What did he say? It's a terrible idea that could have only been invented in California. Oh, <laughs> I, I I will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but there was one other thing that I think was like was a really really big benefit and like an eliminated an entire set of bugs. Uh, does anyone have any? I kind of hinted at it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, exactly. So uh, automatic garbage collection. And not just like the automatic cleanup, but like everything, taking away uh, pointers, uh, restrictions on memory access. If you, in C, if you, if you have like an off by one error and you start writing into array and you're out of bounds, you just start writing into it, like writing into random memory. Uh, like the worst type of bugs. I, I think I had like nightmares about it. It's... Uh, because you can't, it's totally non-deterministic, ridiculous. This stuff eliminated it completely. Um, so again, things improved. And I, awesome example. So this is my C to Java example on the left. Uh, trick question. Does everyone know what the answer on the right is? The Java equivalent? Uh, yeah, nothing. Trick question. Uh, so you, like, as a developer, you don't have to worry about it. I don't, I don't think they even like teach pointers and like memory management and all this stuff in uh, school nowadays. Uh, and then actually the other thing I wanted to point out is like C still exists. Uh, there's actually a lot of, like whereas assembly, I kind of feel like unless you're super, super low level, I know uh, embedded systems, like really restricted. I don't really see it nowadays, but for C, if you need performance, I mean like it's pretty much every, like any type of game engine, any type of like lower level operating system stuff, uh, I put in like, if you guys want to see a funny rant, uh, Linus Torvalds did like a huge rant against C++, like the more object-oriented version on uh, Git, and it's hilarious. And then, yeah, so any like game, all ga as far as I know, most game engines, especially performance-driven, C or C++, Windows, Chrome. Uh, so then let's move on to present time. Computers kind of got faster, and they kind of have more resources. Uh, like where do where do we go next, and is there like a next thing? So, like, what are our goals? Um, I would say like easy transition from older languages, uh, like removing. Is there any more lower level implementation details that we could remove? Is there any like higher level constructs or abstractions that we could add that make things a little bit more human readable? And can can we reduce human 
uh, lines of code further? And is there any, like, actually, the, the other the thing that I underlined was, like, is there another category of bugs that we could just completely eliminate? Uh, no, actually, that's not it. Not even close. Uh, so yeah, and the goal is like, how do I uh, increase developer productivity even further? So I mean, it's just like a simplified triangle of programming languages. Uh, question mark at the top. Is there something? Question mark at the top. Uh, higher level being like what we were talking about. And I'm gonna throw every uh, throw everything, throw a little uh, riddle in or. I'm actually going to add another question mark. Is like, is it is the next thing really at the top, or is it off to the side, just to kind of mess with everyone? Uh, and also, why the JVM? So I could have focused on anything else. Uh, I decided to kind of focus on the JVM. I mean, first of all, because the Java user group. Uh, but second of all, there's like huge advantages to sticking to the JVM. I mean, uh, once you compile the bytecode, I mean, you could still deploy to like any platform. Is it, is it JVM based? It's small talk. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think there is. Uh, I think there are all or some are alternatives. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's definitely a, there are some options. I, I'm only I'm only going to focus on three. Oh, I think Scratch is great. I'm teaching it to my kids. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, check it out. Um, anyway, so what what are some options? I focused on three. Do you guys know like? Like, what are the three big, three main JVM alternatives right now? No, <laughs> no. I actually, in my notes, I said other alternatives <laughs> exist. <laughs> Sorry, JVM. Uh, JVM, uh, non Java JVM languages. Like, the top three. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so Scala, Groovy, and. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so there are three Scala, Groovy, Kotlin. Uh, <laughs> right, okay, so I, and then kind of going back to uh, the mythical man month. I mean, like it really comes down. I, I was gonna just show you guys a couple of examples of what I mean by like leanness, like how e how much easier it is to like code in like a slightly higher level language. So it's just like some random example that I coded together. Uh, it's Java. Uh, I have a list of integers. Uh, I have to, I want to sort in reverse order and double it and then put it back in an array. I mean, so all I want to do is like, here's my list, sort it, reverse it, double it. I mean, Groovy, it's just sort it, reverse it, double it. As in, as opposed to in Java, it's like, hey, I got this weird array as list stuff. I got to uh, map, I got to convert it to a stream, and then I got to like unconvert it using collectors to list. And there's no actually, there's no reverse. Like, so the, I have to do a sorted collections reverse order. Uh, so I mean, like, it, it, it's all about like this leanness. I know. Has, has anyone here coded in Groovy? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would say this might not be the best example. Oh yeah, I have more examples. There's a lot of these things, the, the string and collect are historical. Yeah, they're not. You're right. Like it's behind the scenes, it's not equivalent. So that and, and that's why. Yeah. Actually, it's not type inference. Well, yeah. In this case. In yeah. Uh, yeah. So it it isn't one to one, but I mean, for the purposes of a human, if I just want to like code this and like there there are no behind the behind the scenes, absolutely there are some differences. Like one is dynamically typed, you're going to get a performance hit. Uh, the other one is like the one at the top behind the scenes, you have this thing called streaming. 
Uh, the one at the bottom, you don't. It's just like one after another. You can start with instream.up at the top and take two lines out. Uh, I'm saying there aren't OK, I'm, I'm going to get into other examples. This is just like a random <laughs> example. But like, there's no way you could get as concise as the one at the bottom. Uh, this is slightly smaller, but like other stuff. And I'll give a Scala example as well. Uh, here's my code on the left. Here's my Groovy code on the right. A couple of things I want to point out, parentheses optional, implicit getters and setters. If you don't care about getters and setters, like it's just implicit. They get automatically added. If you still want to add them, you can. Uh, static void main not needed, so for like random one-off scripting, awesome. Uh, you don't even need to define that, like the variable type, uh, name parameters and constructors. I think that's awesome where you can just, in the constructor, explicitly specify what you want to override. Uh, semicolons optional. I think most modern languages don't have semicolons anymore, I think. I don't know. Oh, interpolated strings. So that's where you don't have to do this plus thing. You could just have, in, in Groovy, it's actually called a G string. Uh, but you could just have one string and then inside, uh, if you, you look at my example, actually, the print line on the right, uh, I don't do all like what you typically do in Java. It's quote plus, da -da -da plus, quote, et cetera. Uh, default stack impulse. Uh, same thing with Scala. So I just added to please the, the Scala fanboys here, because like, I know there's some. <laughs> I want to give a Scala example, more or less exactly the same. There's some minor nuances, but whatever. Uh, collections. Uh, same thing, much more succinct. I put a star in there because does anyone know what's what's wrong with my example on the left? So the, the somebody's gonna. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's Java one point eight, not one point nine. Uh, so basically, uh, Java nine. Actually, the one the one one of the things I like with Java nine is they add a whole bunch of factory methods where you could one line um, initialize a hash map. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the exact uh, one of those. Uh, but anyways, uh, e even still, if you switch to one nine, it's just a lot more succinct. Um, and the other nice thing that I want to point out with the, I think Swift have it, has it as well. Scala has it with the underscore instead of it. I find it more readable. But if you have a lambda and it's only one variable, you could actually not define like the variable. You could just call it it. So you could say something like. Uh, I know, like in my example, it's some items each print line it. It's just a little bit more readable. Uh, Scala, it's an underscore. Uh, same thing with like SQL. Uh, so this is like another. Every so often, I know you may have to like throw together some SQL on uh, <laughs> Postgres or something. Uh, another thing that I find really missing from uh, Java is like the multi-line strings. Like I, I would think from a bytecode point of view, you could just implement it and it should just work. I don't, I don't know why. Java doesn't have it. Uh, dynamic types. So if you look at my example of the SQL rows uh, select from, from uh, books, I could actually just call the variables from whatever got returned, and I'll try to figure it out. Uh, and then what else do I have? Uh, a whole bunch of like convenience methods. So I, like, I find like t every so often you got to read a file, and then like, everyone's like either reinventing like how to. Like, Basically, searching on Stack Overflow, like, oh, wait a second, how do I read in a file into a string again? <laughs> or, uh, you know, like, if you're smart, you might like use Guava or I don't know, like Apache Utils. Yeah, but then, filed up lines. Uh, get a stream of lines. A stream of lines. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, the, the point is like. There's a whole bunch of convenience methods built in, files, XML, JSON, REST, console, et cetera, text. Uh, same with like calling a command. So in my example on the right, I want to do like ifconfig, execute, give me the text. I don't know, is there an equivalent in Java? Yeah. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, groovy goodness. Oh, actually, this is another like human readable example. Uh, sorry for the text being a little bit small. But I have this uh, if statement at the top. And it says like, hey, if 1.1 plus, uh, sorry, if 1.1 plus uh, 0.01 equals 1.2 system out print line. And Groovy, it'll correctly, like from a human, like if, if I don't know anything about programming and I read that statement, I would expect it to return true. And Java it does not. Does everyone know why? Floating point. Uh, pardon me? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, so that, uh, so it's big decibel by default. Uh, you could also easily, my example on the right, uh, again, apologies for the smaller text, I could easily add methods to uh, uh, existing classes. It's kind of like, it just makes things a little bit more fluent. Um, uh, return is optional. Uh, I, I could also download dependencies in my code. Uh, I could also like add the little, uh, so the hash exclamation mark where I could then just, once I chmod my script, I could just like run my Groovy script from the command line. Uh, and then actually the other cool, really cool feature that's really awesome is uh, power, power asserts. Uh, so if an assert and the, the Groovy asserts will actually break down the assertions and like show you where the diff is, which I'll kind of get into a little bit later. And actually the now one, this one frustrates me because uh, every so often you may have like a chain of commands that you want to run, but you don't know if which like anything in the middle might be null. So you like you got to do these if statements of hey, if it doesn't equal null, call, call the thing inside. If it doesn't equal null, call the thing inside. A lot of like I think even C sharp has this now where you can just do a, a safe navigation operator uh, and an Elvis operator, which is like hey, only call the next method if the, if you if if you're not null. And then for the last statement, it's like, oh, and if you're, if you're null, just return unknown. Uh, really useful. Has, ever, has everyone has seen this before? Or, uh, okay. Uh, so what's the next um, like big concept or paradigm? Because like, if you look at programming languages, every like 20 years, there's usually like, a big shift. Um, and like, or is there even big one? Because like, are we due for a big shift? Or is like, what do you guys think? Is there going to be a big shift? Sure. Is it going to be functional programming? Uh, I will say I don't think so, <laughs> which I'll get into. Uh, also, just to point out that functional programming has actually been around for decades. Uh, like people have been like really pushing this functional programming thing. It's been around for like I don't know, forty or fifty years, ages. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> Uh, another one, uh, what about uh, the billion dollar mistake? Uh, yeah, uh, the null reference. Uh, so I think this is the guy that invented the null reference. He talks about like all the problems that it's caused. Can we fix that? Um, yes, one of, one of these three languages, in my opinion, does it right. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, colon. Uh, so you get like true null, null safety. Uh, I think of it as like, it's just like how primitives work. You can't stick a null into a primitive. It's, it's always a valid value. Uh, so I mean, that's an analogy that I like to give. And then I know somebody here is gonna say like, oh, why not optional? Like, it's exactly the same, isn't it? Is anyone gonna say that? No? <laughs> okay, because it's not. Uh, it, it itself can be null. Like, so you're back to square one, like you're still gonna get the null pointer exception. You're just adding another layer on top, heap size. Oops. Uh, Debugging is more difficult. It's more verbose. My, my personal opinion, it just pollutes code. Uh, serializing objects, it gets really difficult. Um, like it, it's great in some cases when you're dealing with like functional, like hardcore functional programming. Absolutely great. But for the <laughs> most part, like I've too many times I've seen people just overdo it where they, especially once Java 1.8 came out. They're like, oh, I'm just going to convert everything to optional with, without really understanding like what it was uh, uh, meant for. Everyone agree with the optional part? Yeah, awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, this, this is where things get a little bit opinionated. Uh, really? Even, even, <laughs> even more opinionated. I've, I've had a lot of experiences with all these languages. Uh, Scala. Steep learning curve. Does, every, does everyone agree with me here? Yeah. Uh, poor. Poor. Yeah, I know, but I think there's some kind of bias there. Uh, poor interoperability of the JVM ecosystem. Uh, I think I saw one Scala meetup where uh, the entire meetup was about how to use Scala, like how to uh, use Scala and uh, connect it with like Java primitives. Like it, an entire meetup on just that. Uh, so I, and actually the company behind Scala, uh, Martin, what's his name's, Odersky's company, has actually, not only have they recently renamed, rebranded 
they're also like aggressively doubling down on Java. So like I think they're uh, like they're touting themselves as like the Java and the Scala guys, and like I think some of their stuff they're offering in Java first. Uh, what else? I mean, so, so there's these changes coming along, and then also uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Yammer. Uh, if you investigate what's going on with them, like a couple of them have abandoned it. I think Twitter, the CTO wrote, uh, one of the ex-CTOs was like, okay, we should have never switched to Scala. Uh, LinkedIn, they switched to Scala and then they were like, uh, we're switching back to Java. And then I think Yammer, oh Yammer, there was like this big viral email that got leaked where uh, I think the CTO there just like sent an email to Martin, just like ranting about all the issues and all the problems that they've caused and how they never had a return on investment. Actually, so this isn't my opinion. This is just like, <laughs> these are just <laughs> facts. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then trending down, like what I'm seeing on like the TOB index and like uh, even the Stack Overflow survey, I think in 2016, they were kind of showing a trend down. Uh, what about Groovy? So I haven't like, I'm glad no one's walked out yet. Because I, I find like Scala is actually the, uh, the group of developers that are easiest to really, uh, really offend. I have like, oh my gosh, like, because I, I had to kill off a Scala project once. It was going nowhere. Uh, Anyways, uh, Groovy, uh, easy to learn. I think everyone could agree with that. Excellent interoperability with JV, JVM ecosystem. Pivotal dropped support. Um, two years ago, along with Grails, so that was kind of like a bad sign. It is an official uh, Apache project now. Market trend, eh, it's kind of neutral. It's not really tanking, like Scala. Uh, <laughs> Java, code, uh, Java code is valid, groovy code, uh, and I consider this both a pro and a con. Uh, the con is what I've seen in the past, is like, if you don't really train your developers, then you get like this mishmash of like Java code and groovy code. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Like yeah. Not yeah, all. There's there's some nuances. There's some keywords. There there is some little things that like, for the most part, for the most part, it's pretty easy to like. Yeah. I, but I mean, the problem that I've seen is like you let developers use uh, Groovy, and then like they just start coding Java, and then like a little bit of Groovy, and then like it just becomes a big giant mess, which is like the same concern that I've seen with C and C plus uh, plus. I will also make the argument I put in my opinion is I have personally seen a lot of challenges with dynamic typing for large-scale apps and this goes with JavaScript as well and Ruby uh, but uh, Groovy is optionally typed so you could actually a like on your uh, interfaces whatever just to find the types and you could actually just put in an annotation at the top I forgot what it is and it'll just compile everything will be static it'll force everything static Java or Groovy, but in a lot of uh, financial, they have Groovy is used for like a lot of test code. Oh my gosh, you are like 10 slides ahead of me. Oh, so 10 sorry. slides ahead of me. <laughs> so you, me and you are on the way, same wave band. Uh, I, I, I agree, I agree. <laughs> uh, don't worry, uh, colon, same thing. It's kind of like the new guy. Uh, easy to learn, excellent. A major backing by JetBrains. So actually, if you download IntelliJ, like you have Kotlin support. Uh, so like excellent IDE support. I know it's one of the big issues of Scala at the beginning. Uh, this, for, yeah, I'm trying to give like I'm trying not like I'm trying to give Scala some credit. Uh, uh, true now safety. As it's only it's the only one out of the three that has it. Uh, I'm seeing an upward market trend. Uh, and then also here are my recommendations. These are only my recommendations. Uh, <laughs> but in Scala, I would say be very cautious. Like really, really, really weigh the pros and cons. Maybe, maybe just to like, uh, you know, uh, as an offering a piece, I would say like consider it for like big data. So any type of like really large immutable data transformations with like multiple CPUs, maybe. Uh, but really, the issue that I've seen is where certain developers, often Scala ones, don't really address this premature optimization as the root of all evil. 
where things get thrown around that like, oh, this is gonna be more efficient, this is more efficient. But then when you drill into numbers, it actually isn't. And now you have code that's a lot less readable. Uh, so just make sure that like, if, if whatever you're doing, you're making things less readable or you're optimizing, then like, just profile a get metrics before optimizing. And then avoid the whole like uh, MongoDB scale as web scale. Because uh, I have gotten sucked into these conversations where like, uh, and you can't win them. Like, you, you, like when you get into these, it doesn't just have to be Scala, but where you get into like these buzzword conversations of like, I know uh, Scala has immutable types and it's functional, so we have to use it. Like you can't, if you guys have any suggestions afterwards, like I would love to hear them, but I have gotten into like literally, like has, has everyone seen the YouTube video, MongoDB is web scale? I have gotten sucked into so many of these Scala conversations, I have not figured out a, a solution for this. Because it gets very like, like how do you, but anyways, uh, I would love to hear what you, if you guys have a solution for this, because I haven't figured out my solution now is like, I just don't get involved. Uh, and then what about Groovy? Uh, yeah, consider for secondary work. Right, right there, uh, Gradle, Spock, Jeb, and then any, any type of lighter scripting. Uh, really awesome. Uh, also dynamic data. So I, I've seen a lot of success. There was a project that I was on where uh, we had to code some apps. It was just JSON to JSON mapping, pretty straightforward. In Java, it would have been like three times as much. It would have been three times as much code. So I would have considered something for it like that and also stop using Maven. Is, is, everyone, is everyone here using Gradle? Yes? Good, because I still see people at like brand new projects using uh, Gradle. Uh, and then again, this is an, just in case nobody here knows about Gradle. Like here's my, I think I did like a random uh, spring initializer, spring boot initializer example online. And this actually got chopped off. I chopped off half of it, half the thing on the left. So exactly the, <laughs> exactly the same uh, build script from spring initializer. I think it was like spring boot web, um, one in Maven and then one in Gradle. Uh, like super easy to read. Uh, so I think it was one third of the length. What else do I have? I have Spock. Does everyone know uh, Spock? Like so much better than JUnit. Like it's just much cleaner and easier to read. Uh, so something like y you have, oh, I don't have my cursor, but you have like, you could do parameterized inputs. You could set, you don't have to like do the underscore or like the camel case for defining your tests. And you could also define like given when then blocks. Uh, Easy data, da database support, so at the bottom, I'm just feeding my SQL row data into my parameterized input. Uh, really awesome, so I would actually recommend if you guys like, even if you guys are on Java project, uh, use Spock, it's, it's a lot leaner than like your JUnit uh, alternative. Uh, Jeb, has anyone heard of Jeb? Uh, so Jeb is, uh, it's more of like a, a I would compare it to like your Nightmare JSs or like Codesep JS. It's just like a browser testing framework. Uh, also super fluent, super easy to read. I don't think even in like the the JavaScript space, I would say like the JavaScript alternatives aren't like this clean and easy to read. Like certainly not Nightmare JS. Maybe like Codesep JS. But this like Jeb to me is like probably the cleanest like browser automation uh, uh, framework that I've seen. Uh, yeah, well, anything you, you could point at, like, web, yeah, web driver, something name, whatever uh, you feed at the driver, and it'll work. You can, you can get down to the web driver layer, yeah. but it's uh, basically a high, high level web driver. Yep. It's nice. Uh, it's clean. And then you can also use it with Spock, so you get all the uh, uh, bonuses. Oh, yeah, and then also uh, Groovy Power Asserts. This has saved me a lot of time, because, you know, every time I have, like, an assert, especially if there's, like, multiple function calls, and you're like, oh, it failed. Where did it fail? I mean, so what do people do? They go in through their tests and they add a whole bunch of system print lines and then figure out like where it went now and then they rerun the test and they see what happened. Whereas like with the power cert, it'll actually like show you where it broke down. And in this case, I mean, the strings are almost the same and it'll show you that like, oh look, you're 73% the same. It's just those four words were different. So like huge time saver. Uh, yeah, time saver. Uh, colon. My stance is I would, I would consider for normal application development, like I'd leave it up to my teams. Like if you want to use Colon, go for it. 
Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, so I, some people get very, uh, I leave it up to developers, but by all means, I think it's a low risk thing, especially with like JetBrains support and that it's an easy, uh, easy transition. It's almost completely yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Um, uh, and also, uh, Gradle scripts can now be written in Kotlin if you so want to. I don't, um, and then uh, Android, uh, definitely for Android development. Uh, Gradle now? Gradle. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, next time I do this, I'm going to modify that. <laughs> Uh, Android development, I've heard it called as uh, the Swift of Android. And actually, as of 2007, at Google has actually made it an official uh, language of Android. So, I, like, especially. If, Sorry, they call it a first class language. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. F first class. Because I think they actually call it the, the second. Like, Java is still the first, yeah. but it's definitely like a first class. Yeah. 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 The only thing about, uh, about Android, Jake Wharton took a job at Google. Uh, yep, I didn't know that, but uh, but anyways, I would definitely if you, I would so cons I've consider. I've been on a Swift project on and off for a year now, and I wish it was Scotland because we bought Power Max for the whole team. <laughs> Swift uh, <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars, so that our compiles only took three minutes. Uh, yeah, and Probably Swift has it. Swift has its challenges that I'm going to get into. Uh, so what about Java? Is it going away? Like, like I said in my second slide, no. I'd say like, if you want to keep using it, by all means. Uh, I think where the big benefits are nowadays are actually like more on the the framework side. So like your Spring Boot, Cloud Native, PaaS solutions. Like that's where like I feel like there's like a diminishing returns on the language front. So if you want to like make things more efficient, I'd consider like those things. I'm assuming somebody has given a talk about those things here, right? Yeah, maybe this guy. Uh, and then supplement with Spock, great old Jeb, uh, awesome, uh, in lieu of JUN and Maven. Uh, so that's kind of, but I also wanted to like get into why I don't think we're going to see this evolution to uh, higher levels anytime soon. Uh, whereas like there was like this evolution to like, you know, people don't code in assembly anymore. Even by default, you won't really code in C unless you need performance. My opinion is like, we're not going to see this like, like Java's fine. Y you could use Colon, Groovy, whatever, not Scala, but uh, Java's fine. And I want to get into like why and like some ob observations uh, that I've seen recently in the last couple of years. So first of all, like functional programming, like for the last 10 years, I've been hearing about like, this is going to be the next big thing, like immutable state and like 100% functional. You know, we're going to have like huge amounts of CPU. That's the next big thing. Mind you, like it's been around forever before object-oriented programming. Uh, Mac OS actually dropped automated garbage collection Swift uh, with, when they introduced Swift. So now it's like you have to do the reference coding like with Arc. Yeah, but Arc is also it's, like a type of garbage collection. It's, it, it's, it's different. It's not, you, it introduces it more problems. You're, you have more control. Absolutely, but you have to, you have to, you, okay, uh, you're absolutely right, because it is a type of garbage collection. I treat automated garbage collection as completely automatic, where I don't have to worry about it with what Mac does and iOS does. Like, they have this thing called the uh, Arc, like, it's reference counting, so what you have to be really vigilant about, and Java actually has this, like, the whole uh, uh, strong reference, weak reference, uh, where you only really... You need you as a developer you need to make sure that it's you're setting up your references correctly. It, it's more work on the developer. <laughs> yeah. It's all the circular reference yeah. problem. Exactly. Yeah, if they haven't solved it, it's not garbage collection. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Uh, and then I, iOS actually never really had it as far as I know. Correct. And the reason actually I've read books about this, like why they never added it, and from the estimates that they gave is to get performance. Uh, to get comparable performance, you need double the RAM. Uh, that's the studies that I've seen. Yeah, that's why Android devices have more yeah. of the RAM than iOS devices. Yeah, exactly. So they can delay the garbage collection. Yeah, so that's why like your and like typical Android devices have more RAM, but it's typically the iPhones that score higher. 
and that's one of the reasons. Uh, and then I, I'm also seeing like, I don't know if middle, I don't know if there's like a better name than middle level languages, but what I'm seeing over the last couple of years is like this resurgence of more like lower middle level languages that do away with a lot of this higher level stuff for performance. So I mean like your Go's and your Rust. Uh, Go has full automated garbage collection, Rust does not. Um, but I am like seeing the shift towards these languages. And then also what I'm seeing in a lot of bigger companies is like the shift away from dynamically styped languages. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna go away. I think they're great for some things, but like I see like, I think Twitter's, re so go ahead, go ahead. I, and, yeah. Uh, and for example, Rust, they're looking at uh, putting Rust uh, into uh, web pages, so it will run your web assembly code and stuff like that. Yeah. And basically, so I think it serves a different market. So it's, yeah, it's absolutely. I think, I think systems programming is not going to go away. Application programming is also. I mean, it's, but it's just different markets. I think. I again, you uh, you uh, <laughs> you're like five oh, slides yeah. ahead of me. <laughs> it's like you wrote, you wrote, you uh, read my deck. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, so I'm seeing the shift away from them. Uh, other changes, I mean, uh, Java introduced uh, streams and like lambdas. So I mean, like this big argument that I heard from certain uh, other JVM language groups is like, hey, you know, we have mutable types and we have like functions and all this stuff. Well, I don't know, like Java 8 has it. You could, you could make immutable lists and you could make immutable hash maps and you could like have lambdas. Uh, what else? Uh, and then also there's been like a lot of other, not necessarily language, language changes, but like framework <laughs> changes that have made like programming leaner that have given a lot of like velocity improvements. Uh, and then also at like in the last 10 years, I mean, there's been a very, very big focus on battery life and performance, especially in the mobile space. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to like talk about is just living on the plateau. Does anyone read Uncle Bob? Because actually, I just pulled this off of his latest blog post to explain actually the big change. And this is, this is actually like, if you, if you really want to annoy a Scala developer, you show them this next graph. Uh, so I mean, like, so the big change, like, I mean, the big thing that for the, the longest amount of years I've been hearing from that community is like, oh yeah, CPU counts. You know, we're going to have like 12 CPUs and like 10 gigahertz and 20 gigahertz Moore's Law. Uh, this is a graph I pulled off from uh, the blue line specifically, the, uh, sorry, the dark blue. Uh, you're looking, that's the clock, average clock speeds uh, over the last, I know, since 1970, they started like totally plateauing. Uh, and the, to give you guys an example, uh, this machine, I bought this four weeks ago, went to Apple Store, I was like, give me the most powerful 13-inch uh, without the silly touchpad, 2.3 gigahertz dual core. 10 years ago, I bought a white MacBook, not even a Pro, and I think it was like 1.8 dual core. So there has been like a plateau. And I don't feel like it's getting talked a lot about. Uh, sorry, I don't think it's being talked at all. People are still like, you know, uh, CPUs are gonna keep going up, all this stuff. Mm, here's the graph, it's not. Well, sorry, it's uh, sorry because it's, it's also the counts. Uh, you're right. Like it's also the CPU counts. They haven't gone up. Sure, but anything. Uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, if you if I had ten thousand dollars, I could go buy one like the latest uh, iMacs. It's not for a user machine. Yeah. I'm talking server space, and not to mention like you said it yourself. You're talking about cloud native. The number of machines. I would, today, I would, an order of magnitude higher than it was I, I would argue <laughs> that uh, well, the, the, the machines like opinion, a, that's yeah, fact. Yeah, the number yeah. of cores that my the code runs, runs on today is a little is bit at more. At least an order of magnitude higher than it was 10 years ago. At what do you least. The difference is it's not running on the same OS. I don't know. This like this is still dual core. Yeah, you're right. Like I could get really powerful machines, but your I default your default laptop, you your default laptop, it's different. I'm just saying. Yeah. I I know. Uh, I heard. <laughs> 
so and this is this is why I got into that Scala comment of like yes absolutely if you have like non if you, if you have if you have if you if you have a lot of CPUs even big data but like for your average like, like I would never write a video game in Scala or Java for that no, matter but, 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 yeah but it's the case too like most CRUD applications aren't going to need to be running yeah. 40 cores yeah most CRUD applications, like there's a, a massive number of business applications out there that you can just run them on a single core calculator yeah, most, iPhone. Most web, web presences are run on. Yeah. Okay. I, and I, I will add another statement because this is from my experience with Scala is people often make the false assumption that you're CPU bound. So yes, and, and I'll get into this in the next slide. I think we're moving into a way where you really have to weigh the pros and cons. If you have, if you have like, uh, and I think big data makes it easier because of the functional, like you kind of for free, if you set things up correctly and you have all the CPUs kind of for free, like Scala does it for you. You don't have to like, yeah. Uh, Yep. Hey, you're, you're I would say, and, and this is where I've seen the most mistakes, uh, like coming from like a video game programming background where uh, like whenever I was doing hardcore optimization, I would profile it. Like, Hey, is this thing, is this crazy inline assembly that's totally going to make my code less readable and less maintainable? And like, I'm sorry, like Scala makes things less maintainable and less harder to read. I'm not a Scala fan. Uh, <laughs> I know some people are going to argue that, but like, yes, absolutely. If you could prove to me that, like, oh my gosh, look, this thing is going to run ten times as fast, and over the long run, I know you're going to save ten thousand dollars a year in like AWS fees. Yeah. yeah, well, this is like your standard cloud applications. I don't see them being CPU bound. Uh, yes, yet, yet, all programming is still done in C. So you gotta like, like the true. I see. I think this is where the disconnect is because I want to like point out that if you go to Stack, like this is a huge, huge argument that I see online. If you like Google. The stuff on like on Stack Overflow. I think I was reading something last night where people talk about like, these higher languages. Where oh, if you uh, you know your compilers are so smart nowadays, and then if you use something like Java or the CLR, that like things are so smart that it'll figure it'll figure out what the CPU is and they'll optimize things, and you can never make C as efficient. Yet anything where you're really, really, really CPU bound, uh, and it, like CPU performance matters, like games. Like you're totally you're bound by actually, CPU. You're near real time. Actually, the game. Yeah. So the, the, the resources yeah. it's, that are it's out in the game is, yeah. is the GPU, not the CPU. Generally. Yeah, but you still like. No, like most modern okay, games or, are maxing out modern CPUs. <laughs> like it's That's not. not yeah, but even okay, even your GPU programming, you're not gonna you're gonna go lower level. Of course. Yeah. But it's a completely different. Yeah, there's there's a certain benefit. The lower level you go, if you know what you're doing. You could always do better. So, so here's, here's yeah. the fallacy this is a, with the yeah. functional programming. You, you're saying I need functional programming for uh, scaling on a lot of cores, but the reality is that people aren't scaling by adding more cores. They're scaling by going distributed. They don't know what VM they're running on. So people are saying I'm running multiple what copies. What is the impression that that is? When, when people talk about multiple cores, they're not talking necessarily about no, multiple no, no, cores on, on a single let me, machine. Let, let me think. <laughs> if you make a single program, a single process uh, functional on the on the idea that I get the argument for it, that I'm going to schedule them onto multiple <coughs> cores, that's more parallel, you, that's not what the typical people in enterprise are doing. In the enterprise, they're saying, I'm going to run multiple processes. And those could be on different, uh, will end up on different machines. Well, so it doesn't, actually, it doesn't help you. Like, if you give me a 100 core CPU, my web app isn't going to run any faster. But in, in, in with enterprise programming, you're a bit of a bigger problem at the tip of the IO. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're doing like na naive number crunching, which that's a different class of applications where functional techniques is not 
Absolutely. Yep, I, absolutely, which I uh, called out. Uh, but I got to start. Uh, I got five minutes, so I'm going to quickly skim over things, and then you guys could like rant and like <laughs> throw <laughs> throw angry angry words at me later. So I'm going to make my predictions. Uh, I think Java is going to remain a popular language. You guys don't have to worry about losing your jobs. Uh, uh, I think like this mid-level programming. If you guys have a better name for it, let me know. Uh, <laughs> If you, if you guys if you guys have a better name for this mid level programming, uh, okay. And this is this is the big thing that I want to call out is like pick the right tool for the right job. Uh, I, I think uh, true knowledge, true knowledge safety will be a significant benefit. Any modern language should have it. Uh, no big language shift will happen anytime soon. We're not going to go 100% functional. Uh, there's no silver bullets. Um, and then like the big productivity increases that I see are like the low hanging fruits or like the frameworks deployments lean process Spring Boot has. And then like this is my new pyramid. Uh, it's totally simplified. I'm sure there's other stuff. And then also like my additional reading, if you guys like, because I, like, I love programming languages. Steve Yeagy, guy from Google, he wrote a big, uh, he, he wrote, a, I, I think he just compiled his blog, posts, great book, rants about programming languages. He actually also rants about Java. But uh, Rapid de Development, same guy that wrote Code Complete, also a really great book. Uh, Uncle Bob, he's written a lot about programming languages. I think his last, po last post was about the, um, uh, the plateau. And then also uh, MongoDB is webscale.com and also the corresponding video. And I think there's another one called uh, Node.js is bad, Badass Rockstar Attack. That's another uh, great video <laughs> on uh, YouTube. Uh, yeah, so that's it.